Thank you, President DeJoya, for the introduction to the center and conference and highlighting the importance of the topics we're going to discuss today. And thank you, Professor Agarwal, for organizing this exciting conference. I wish I could attend all five days. We're delighted to welcome David Rubenstein back to Georgetown to kick off our week-long conference on the future of global finance in addressing societal challenges. I can think of no better convener than the Center for Financial Markets and Policy at the McDonald's School of Business for this event, and no better guest than David Rubenstein to lend his expertise and thought leadership in the area to this discussion. At the McDonough School of Business, we provide our students with the knowledge, skills, and confidence necessary to address the world's most complex issues. And we know those issues often lie at the intersection of disciplines. We are pleased to have Georgetown faculty from across the university as part of this week's program so that we can explore these important financial issues through multiple lenses. We are also fortunate to be located in Washington, DC, a global capital city that's home to much more than government. We're at the crossroads of policy, diplomacy, and international business. And we're a Jesuit institution. So it is core to our values that we use our expertise in business and management to make a positive difference to the world. All of these ideas are manifest in the theme of today's conference. And we hope that you, corporate leaders, policymakers, scholars, alumni, and students are able to learn from our distinguished speakers and bring new perspectives and knowledge to your work. Our keynote this afternoon is definitely no stranger to Washington DC or to principal leadership or to finding innovative solutions to complex problems. David Rubenstein is co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest and most successful private investment firms. Since its founding in 1987, Carlyle has grown into a firm managing over $221 billion from 31 officers in the world. A Baltimore native, David earned an undergraduate degree from Duke University before graduating from the University of Chicago Law School. He practiced law in New York before serving as chief counsel to the United States Senate Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, and then as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy during the Carter administration. After his White House service and before co-founding Carlisle, David practiced law in Washington with what is now the Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw and Pittman firm. David has a long history of service to nonprofit organizations. He's been chairman of the board of trustees of the JFK Center for Performing Arts and the Council of Foreign Relations, a fellow of the Harvard Corporation, a regent of the Smithsonian Institution, a trustee of the National Gallery of Art, the University of Chicago, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Johns Hopkins Medicine, the Institute for Advanced Study, the National Constitution Center, the Brookings Institution, and the World Economic Forum, quite a list. He's been a director of the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and president of the Economic Club of Washington. Additionally, David is the original signer of the Giving Pledge and a recipient of the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy and the MoMA's David Rockefeller Award, among other philanthropic awards. As a leader in the area of patriotic philanthropy, David has also made transformative gifts for the restoration or repair of numerous institutions, including the Washington Mon Monument, Monticello, Mount Vernon, Arlington House, the Iwo Jima Memorial, and so many more. He's the host of the David Rubenstein Show, 
peer-to-peer -peer conversations on Bloomberg TV and PBS, and Leadership Live with David Rubenstein by Bloomberg Media, and the author of the books, The American Story, Conversations with Master Historians, and How to Lead, Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers. David, it's an honor to have you with us today to share your thoughts on how we can do well in business while also doing well for the world. Thank you for taking the time to speak at our event. And it's now my pleasure to turn the program back over to Rena Agarwal to begin the fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Almeida. And uh, I, I just want to point out to our audience, uh, please feel free to send in your questions as we go along using the chat feature. And I'll try to incorporate them as we go along. So David, it's a little bit uh, intimidating to uh, interview someone who is the dean of interviewers, right? With uh, everything that you've done, but, uh, but I'll give it a try. I'm sure you'll do extremely well. <laughs> We just heard your introduction, right? And your interests, they span so many different areas. What is the common theme? And how do these come together? How do you find the time to do these and do them so exceptionally well? Well, I don't play golf. That saves a lot of time. And, um, you know, I don't have that many outside hobbies, so I am not uh, doing painting or things like that. But uh, everything I'm doing is something I love doing. So it's not really work for me, it's a pleasure. I've reached the point in my life where I'm fortunate that I can do what I wanna do. And so I'm just doing things that I find intellectually interesting and hopefully uh, I, they'll give back to the country for my good fortune to have done what I've been able to do in the country. So um, I you know, manage my time just like everybody else does. And I, you know, I don't find it that difficult. I just really love what I'm doing. Uh, so, David, uh, Dean Almeida mentioned uh, your most recent book, How to Lead, right? Uh, so, you've been an author in addition to everything else that you're doing. How, how did you decide to write this book? What is the message that you want uh, readers to get out of this book? Well, the more point I wanted to get uh, was this, and the background is that for the last five or six years, I've been interviewing people at, uh, on Bloomberg and PBS, and I took the best 30, some of those, and distilled them and tried to discern what the leadership lessons were, and then said, here's what these people have to say about being a leader. Why is that important? Well, we have seven and a half billion people on the face of the earth. Everybody can't be a leader, but we can't have all followers either. So we want to have society that moves forward. And I think society moves forward with good leaders. So I was hoping to get younger people to read the book and say, yes, I can do that, or this inspires me to do something better than what I'm doing. And then maybe some of these people will wind up being the Jeff Bezos and the Bill Gates and the Yo-Yo Ma's and the David Petraeus's in the future. So that's what I hope to be able to do. Uh, you know, the point about young people is really important. Uh, we, we are going to be distributing the, the book to some of our students at Georgetown because it's just so important for them to learn and think about yeah, they, they can do whatever they want to do in the future and be some of these leaders. Terrific. Well, I think that life is uh, complicated, as everybody listening knows, and you can walk through life and not really try to accomplish that much. But I think life is more enjoyable if you have a purpose, you're trying to accomplish something. And the most important thing you're trying to accomplish is help other people with their own lives. And so that's what all these people have in common. They were really trying to help other people not become famous themselves or do things that they thought would make society better. And I think they did. And so that's what I hope younger people who are watching today are, will think about it. What can I do to make a, the world a better place? What can I do to make a difference? There's no one formula for doing it, but there are many characteristics that leaders have in common. And hopefully the people who read it will, will, will see some of those characteristics. Yeah, and you've said uh, 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 that you really enjoy doing what you're doing. That's why you're doing it and it's not work for you. So during these COVID times, what have you been doing, right? You're not flying around as much, I assume. So what are some of the things you've been doing? Well, COVID has changed the world for everybody, obviously. And it, when you think about it, the Industrial Revolution changed the way we live and work over a hundred year period or so. 
the advent of, let's say, uh, the internet changed the way we live and work over maybe a 20, 25 year period of time. And then you could say smartphones have changed the way we do things maybe over a seven or eight year period of time. Uh, COVID has changed the way we live and work over just a one year period of time. So in a very, very short period of time, we have changed the way we go to work, the way we travel, the way we live, the way we exercise, the way we do things. And I suspect it's not going away anytime soon because many people say, why do I need to travel around the world so much? Many people say, I actually like working out of my home. Now, I suspect some people want to go back to work eventually and go back to their offices, but I don't think people are going to go back the way they did before, travel the way they did. And so life has really changed. In my own case, I've been uh, in, in my house for most of the time. I barely left and I just you know do some Zoom meetings or interviews or speeches and I've actually gotten things done because I don't have to travel as much. I used to travel 240 days a year. And while I wasn't, uh, I thought inefficient to do that because I was getting to meet people, in hindsight, I probably could have saved a lot of time by doing things that now it seem commonplace, which is to do a Zoom call. So for example, uh, I used to travel to Abu Dhabi for a, an hour meeting, or I would go to Singapore for a one hour meeting and then sometimes come back. So I might schedule some other meetings in those periods of time, but the main meeting I was going might be a one hour meeting. And now I don't really need to do that because I can have Zoom calls with these people, so I'm saving time. But it clearly has made all of us think about what life means. And because COVID's real message to people is not only that we weren't really, really prepared for a pandemic, and it wasn't only that we're gonna change the way we live and work, but it is how fragile life is. Um, I am a person who always saw myself as a um, aging baby boomer. I'm 71 years old. I used to think that was old when I was in the White House. Ronald Reagan was running against us in 1980. He was 69. I said, how can anybody that old get up out of bed in the morning? I was then 31. Now 71 seems like a teenager. In fact, I'm so young, I'm not even qualified to run for president. I would have been too young to run for president of the United States being only 71. But to be very serious, when you're 71 years old and COVID hits, uh, you can have a very serious problem. And so all of us who have my age or, or older or around my age probably have worried about their own mortality during this period of time. Because if you get unfortunate and you get COVID and some members of my family, fortunately they're younger than me, have gotten it, uh, it can be the end of your life. And so I've tried very hard to be not uh, doing things that's socially inappropriate and tried very hard to stay at home and hopefully this will pass. Hopefully the vaccine will come along and hopefully we can get back to our normal lives. But it has made me think about what I wanna do with the rest of my life and how fragile life really can be. Yeah. So uh, let me turn to the economy and finance a little bit. And uh, you've uh, talked about COVID. There's serious concern out there that COVID and uh, even financial market performance, th they've really ended up, uh, and this will be a problem in the longer run uh, and the short run, they've widened the racial and income inequality issues. So how can finance play a role? How can financial markets play a role to address this uh, issue of inequality, which is, a, which is a big thing in our country? The income inequality level in our country before COVID was as bad as anything since 1929. And it's gotten much, much worse. It's been exacerbated. And it's created what I've called a COVID cliff, which is you fall into the cliff because you don't have a job that now is any longer relevant. You don't have a job that uh, gives you health insurance. You don't have a job that enables you to have uh, uh, health care at home or even uh, child care at home. And you have to keep your children home from school in some cases. It enables people, it has enabled people to realize how fragile their existence is. So many people are living paycheck to paycheck. Last night on the evening news, there were pictures of long lines of cars in Dallas, a wealthy city, relatively speaking, waiting to get food because these people don't have food any longer in Dallas. And Dallas is just representative of so many other uh, cities in the United States. So it's a big problem. And this is the problem. We're gonna get a vaccine. It's not gonna come around overnight. Uh, we knew, we saw some good news today. And probably by the end of this year, the end of, I should say the end of next year, uh, we will probably have everybody more or less vaccinated, though it's not that easy to get it distributed. Not everybody, not easy to convince everybody to take the vaccine, but essentially by the third or fourth quarter, we should have a fairly robust vaccination program underway. And I think the worst of this will be behind us. However, for those people that lost their jobs, they're not getting those jobs back so easily. For those people that don't have health insurance, they're not gonna get health insurance all of a sudden. 
So the, the crater is going to be bigger and bigger. And I think the ability of people to get out of that crater is going to be harder and harder. And so the financial markets, um, they are doing reasonably well. And I think all corporations have to say, what is my social responsibility to help the community I live in, to help the country I live in, deal with the problems of the people who are now out of work? The unemployment rate is said to be 8%, but that's very, very misleading because we only count people who are looking for jobs in the last month. So people who have given up looking for jobs, if they were counted, I suspect the unemployment rate is closer to 15% or so. Now, the economy has come back more strongly than people would have thought. Yes, but that's because we put $3 trillion in of additional assistance from the Congress and 4 to $6 trillion from the Fed. And if we don't keep that up, at some point, it's going to get really worse than it is now. And again, the, the virus is still very, very strong, and I don't think it's going away in the next two or three or four months. So we have to not let these people fall behind, so much so that we have a tale of two cities in our country. We have the very wealthy people, and we have the people that can get by and okay, but then we have the people that have fallen into a crater, and they're never going to escape, and they're going to be a permanent underclass. Unfortunately, in our society, we don't do something about that. So we have a question here. Do you have thoughts on uh, the marginal health benefits and sort of lockdowns versus the economic costs of lockdowns? Well, of course, this has been debated, and I, I do think that it's you have the fatigue factor from lockdowns too, uh, right? If we were, if we had gone into a lockdown right when this came about, I suspect we'd be in better shape today. Why is it that in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and even China, and also Singapore, the uh, positivity rates are so much lower and the mortality rates are so much lower? I think it's not because we're testing too much. I think it's because they had a better program in part because they had some lockdowns. Now, lockdowns don't work perfectly. We've seen in Europe, that the virus is coming back fairly strongly and there were some lockdowns there. So it's not as if lockdown will solve all the problems. But today, because we people are tired of where we're what we're doing, I don't think you can do lockdowns as readily or with as much cooperation as you would have been able to do it a year ago. So I suspect in some narrow uh, communities in some areas, we might be able to do lockdowns, but I don't think that's gonna be the solution. We've gotta do the same things that were done in, in the great uh, influenza flu. In the Spanish flu, the great influenza, in 1918, there were three things that people were told to do. Wash their hands regularly, socially distance, and wear a mask. Those things will make the greatest difference. Lockdowns can be helpful, but too many people, I think, were not going to comply with lockdowns, and there are ways to get around them. So I, I just think it's not going to be the sole solution. But I think it, it does have some marginal impact in improving some areas, but I don't think that's going to be the solution for this country right now. Again, related to COVID, there's another question. Are there going to be some irreversible paradigm shifts in the post-COVID world that uh, concern that should concern business, society, and uh, how, how would we address them? Well, sure. Um, you know, I interviewed for one of my shows, Mark Cuban, a lot long ago, the, uh, the owner of the Dallas basketball team and a well-known entrepreneur. And he said that he thought the greatest entrepreneurial act, um, opportunity that he's seen in his lifetime is really COVID. Now, COVID has tragedies, of course. 240,000 Americans have died. Many have been injured, uh, but not died. And, and obviously, millions of people around the world have died. However, he thought as an entrepreneur, just looking at it as an entrepreneur, new businesses are going to be uh, started. Uh, there's new opportunities. There's ways to do things that people hadn't thought of before. And so I do think that there's going to be very good um, investment opportunities but I do think that some industries are going to be left behind. Uh, the travel industry, the hotel industry, the cruise ship industry, the restaurant industry. These industries may come back, the movie theater industry. They may come back, but I think they might be a shell of themselves for quite some time. Now, as a general rule of thumb, and you would know in the business school world, I guess they would call this the reversion to the mean. There's often a reversion to the mean. And so probably in five years or 10 years, people will come back to doing more social, um, socializing in person. They will travel more that will kind of revert to the mean of what they've done in previous years. But I think it's going to take a while. And I think some people are just not going to go back to the mean. Some people are going to be happy not to have to travel as much, not to have to go to events that they don't really want to go to when they can do them over Zoom. So I do think there's going to be a big change in the way we conduct our lives. And uh, so you've talked about the role of business in a society, right? And the, there's been this discussion and debate going on about stakeholder capitalism. And there are two sides to this debate uh, where, you know, one side definitely believes we've got to go 
beyond shareholder uh, uh, capitalism to stakeholder ca capitalism. And then there's another side that thinks uh, stakeholderism is going to increase the insulation of corporate leaders from shareholders, from accountability, from economic performance. Uh, what is your take on this? For, for those who may not be familiar with this debate, essentially, uh, people like Milton Friedman and his predecessors like Frederick Hayek and others, they had the view that capitalism was a very good economic construct, the best anybody has come up with, and that in the capitalist system, companies' greatest obligation is to work on the behalf of their uh, owners, their shareholders. And so Milton Friedman from the 1970s on basically propounded the, the th thought that companies should make the highest profits they can legally and then let the owners decide to do what they can with those profits. Uh, about 50 years ago, uh, another man named Klaus Schwab, who started the World Economic Forum, came up with the idea, and he wasn't the only one, that said stakeholder capitalism is important too, which is to say CEOs who worry not only about their shareholders, but their employees, their customers, the society, the neighborhoods, the countries in which they live in. And they should worry about certain social purposes as well. That debate is now going forward. And I think that the, a, a, the better side of the debate is that companies should worry about more than just their shareholders. The shareholders should know in advance that company CEOs aren't going to worry only about economic uh, returns. They're going to worry about other things. And the reason why I think that's the better debate is because I think as the world is moving forward, it's very likely that if you worry about ESG-related factors, your company is going to get more customers, have more employees, more desirable employees, and be better run. And so the world's moving in that direction. And I think, therefore, if you were only worried about returns on, on uh, your investment and nothing else, I think you're going to be left behind. That's my own view. And what do you see, this is a question that has come up in the chat, what do you see the sort of the role of the government uh, and the role of the private sector? Who, who plays what right. role? If you think about it, American capitalism is a unique uh, kind of uh, creature. Uh, think about it this way. The analogy I would use is, is that when the Big Bang occurred, uh, ultimately we created the universe, the multiverse, but the earth came out of it, a very unusual confluence of events that created our solar system and the earth. And it's not sure they could be replicable and we're not, we, we're not sure there's anything else like an earth in, in, their, in our, in our uh, universe. Maybe there is, but we don't know. Uh, American capitalism is something unique as well. An Anor enormous number of unusual events came together, came together to create this, um, this capitalism that's really not replicable anywhere else. There's different forms of capitalism. There's European capitalism, there's Asian capitalism, there's Chinese capitalism, but we have a unique form of capitalism. And I think it's, it's a capitalism that works well, though it has the problems of leaving some people behind from time to time. But I do think the American form of capitalism um, works reasonably well, but it has to be improved. I and mean, it cannot afford to only worry about the winners. It has to make sure that the losers aren't left behind. The great thing about American capitalism, it does create a lot of wealth. It incents entrepreneurs to create great, great companies. But in the, in the end, some people will be left behind. And so you have to create a social network that's or a social safety network that enables the people who are left behind to be able to get educated and to catch up to some extent. I do think that uh, other forms of capitalism have their virtues as well. European capitalism probably has a greater social net than we do in the United States, but obviously they don't have the entrepreneurs and the economic dynamism that we have in the United States. So it's a trade-off. I would not trade what we have though for, for other kinds of forms of capitalism. But one of the issues that you brought up and we'll be talking a lot about uh, this week is ESG, right? Uh, so how, how, is, uh, how do you expect, what kind of changes uh, do you expect with ESG in the future uh, in your industry, in private equity specifically, but more broadly uh, in terms of businesses, right. institutional investors, uh, how are they addressing ESG and what will change in the future? Well, it used to be, let me just take my own industry as an example. It used to be in private equity, you invested dollars and, and you tried to get the highest rate of return you could legally get. You didn't worry about uh, diversity. You didn't worry about inclusion. You didn't worry about environmental factors. You didn't worry about good governance and other kinds of things. You had no interest other than the highest rate of return. And the result was some very high rates of return, but also some failures in terms of things that didn't work out as far as society is concerned. Today, I think there's a general view that ESG factors should be taken into account. But the main thing that's changed over the last, I'd say, five years or so, and probably will change even more over the next five years, is that a concern about ESG is not seen any longer 
as a willingness to take a lower rate of return. Initially, it was thought that you're going to get a lower rate of return if you worry about ESG factors. Now, it's generally taken the view, I believe, and correctly so, that you're going to get a higher rate of return. Why? Because the best employees want to work with companies that are socially responsible. The best customers want to work with companies that are socially responsible. The best uh, employees that you can have are ones that represent societies. You want a diverse employee base and diverse management base. And if you have those things, you're going to do better. And ultimately, you're going to create a better company. So I think the view now is if you don't have very good ESG factors in a private equity investment you're going to make, you're not likely to have very good uh, performance. And in our own case, Mike Carlisle, we have an ESG uh, team, and they make certain that all the investments we, we look at have ESG factors that are good, and they can be improved if they're not as good as we'd like them to be. And then we make sure that, that we do everything as long as we own a company to improve its ESG performance. Right. Well, another issue out there is uh, that this discussion about how there's a disconnect between the economy and the financial markets. Right. The markets keep going up, but as you've mentioned, there are lots of challenges in the economy for, uh, for Main Street. And uh, what are you, what's your take on that? Well, is there a disconnect? What is the stock market capture versus what is the economy all about? The economy went into a recession in 2020. Uh, we're coming out of it. Uh, normally, it takes about two years to come out of a recession in terms of get back to where you were before. Uh, it could take a little bit longer here, it depends on the vaccine and some other factors. Um, but the economy was very, very hard hit, uh, maybe more hard hit in the second quarter than anything we've seen since the Great Depression. However, the U.S. government said we're going to step in and they put a staggering amount of money, three trillion dollars in. And the Fed put in the, about four to six trillion dollars of loans or, or loan uh, availability. The result was the economy didn't go down quite as much as we thought. And it's coming back a little quicker than we thought. However, um, we should recognize that. While the, the, that is good and the economy has, you know, is recovering, the stock market seemed to boom in many cases. So how can it be the case that with the economy being relatively sick, the stock market was booming? In fact, in many cases, uh, companies did so much better than anybody ever thought. Well, the answer is the companies that did very well are the tech companies. So if you were in the restaurant business, you're in the hotel business or the airline business, the cruise ship business, you didn't do so well. So your people get misled when they look at market indices because on the market indices, they tend to reflect the values of Microsoft, Apple, um, Amazon, Google. These companies are Alphabet. These companies have disproportionate influence in these market indices because they have such a large market value. So when they double in value, as let's say Amazon did during this period of time, or essentially did, you, you see a disproportionate impact on the market going up. When in fact, if you were to take out the, the, the technology leaders, the market has really much reflected the economy. It's, it's down. Uh, if you were to take out the technology leaders. So the market is a good forward indicator, but the market indices now just reflect unduly the size of these large technology companies and they're going forward at great rates. They don't really reflect the restaurant companies, the, the uh, you know, taxi cab companies and other things that have been really hard hit. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, what, what is your outlook for the economy? For the global economy and you know whether it's interest rates the economy inflation where do you see opportunities where do you see challenges well the, the global economy um let's divide it into you know different parts the u.s economy today is coming back uh, as soon as the vaccine is really distributed and is actually uh being used by people a lot of people don't want to take the vaccine but if the people take it and it actually is fully distributed uh, in a reasonable way by the end of the year, I think next year should be a, I mean, next uh, 2022 should be a, a reasonably good year and probably will be in pretty good shape by 2022, assuming no new virus comes along and that's a, a risk as always. And, uh, but I think the US economy is in better shape than the European economy. I think the Europe doesn't quite have the ability we do to kind of financially buttress its economy um, the way we do. Now, the area that's coming back and is really leading the global economy right now is Asia. China has come back quite strong uh, Taiwan is doing quite well, Korea is doing well, Japan is doing well, uh, Singapore is doing well, and I think India is doing, uh, it's had some challenges, but I, I think India is not, uh, you know, it's not in bad shape as I, some people might have thought it would be. So I think the Asian economy is doing well, and it, as the new trade agreement that was announced over the weekend, where the largest trading economies in, in Asia, not counting India, 
are, are now coming together in a kind of uh, trade agreement, I think that's really going to propel them even further forward. So I think Asia is in reasonable shape. I think the United States is OK, but we got to get the vaccine done. Europe may lag behind a bit. But I think the biggest problem is the emerging markets of, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and some parts of Southeast Asia, because these economies have se severe levels of poverty. They don't have the healthcare systems that we have in the United States. They're probably not going to get the vaccines as quickly as they, would, as they should get them. And I do think they're going to lag behind in creating a big problem for the world because the global economy is going to be uh, doing, going forward. I think the, some of the emerging markets are going to be lagging very much so behind. I want to go back to COVID. There's a question here, um, and, the, uh, and Kurt is asking, I'd love to hear your thoughts on COVID and the effects on company culture and how to sustain and grow that culture while working remotely. Every company has its own culture, just like every country has its own culture. And those cultures are, are given to people when you work in a setting. So when you work in a company, you pick up signs on how to conduct yourself, how to get for, move forward, how to do things well. You get those signs in life from, you get the cultural signs from your classmates, from your friends, from your parents. These are passed down over you know, periods of time. You get these same kind of signals from people that you work with. But if you're not working with them in person, you're not having lunch with them, you're not having dinner with them, you're not having a drink with them, you don't see them at the water cooler, you're not having a coffee break with them, you don't pick up the signs in quite the same way. So I think there is a worry and there's a fear that's legitimate that the cultural um, acclimation is not going to be as good for the younger people as it would have been had they been in person. For example, a lot of people who are hired to work in uh, companies, companies like mine, they have not, they've been working for almost a year for us and they haven't met anybody virtually and in, in, in reality, they've been, been working in virtu uh, virtually. And as a result, I don't think they're, they're, they're picking up quite the signs and having all the benefits that you would get if you were actually in person. Same thing is true of, of freshmen in college. If you go to a freshman, you're a freshman in college and you are now doing everything virtually, you're staying at home in the same room you're in when you were in high school, it probably not, doesn't have the same benefit. So I think there is going to be a lost year or a lost year and a half for people. They'll have to acclimate. They'll have to catch up. But it's a harder and harder to pass along culture uh, when you're in this situation. Second point is that Many companies are now beginning to recognize that their culture needs to change. The culture, not just for the young people, but I'm talking about everybody, the culture has to change. You can't say, I want you to work in the office 80 hours a week. You can't say to people, um, uh, you, you need to be um, you know, here at all hours. Or you can't say to people, travel around the world for a meeting. I think increasingly people are gonna change their culture and say, you wanna work at home? You can do so. Microsoft has said, you can work at home permanently if you want to. And I think some of the other tech companies are gonna do the same. So. People's cultures are going to change and companies' cultures are going to change. And I think the ones that change the most and adapt the most to the situation we have now are going to do the one, or be the ones that are the most successful. There are two questions here, David, about real estate. Can you offer your thoughts into the commercial real estate market, the investment market? Well, in commercial real estate, there are, uh, let's say, two schools of thought. One school of thought is that commercial real estate is not going to uh, do as well as it did before because not as many people are going to come and use their offices. And so employers are going to downsize. And what they're going to say is, I had 500,000 square feet for my employees in, in New York City. I don't need 500,000 square feet. Maybe I need 400,000 square feet. And one of the reasons is we're going to basically do hoteling, which is to say we won't have a permanent office for somebody anymore because they're only going to come in two or three days a week. So they'll just kind of get a new office every time they come in. And therefore, we can shrink the number of offices we have. Another school of thought is that people will eventually go back to, as I say, revert to the mean. They want to go, go to the office five days a week, but they want more space. The cubicles that we're all familiar with that people have been seeing uh, proliferate over the last 10 and 15 years will have to have bigger cubicles and more space for people so they feel socially distanced in an appropriate way. Um, you know, I, I suspect, though, in the end, I, I, it depends on the cities, but some cities, I suspect, will see people not come back to the office as much and have fewer space. And some cities, I suspect some city people will come back uh, and want a bit more office space. It just depends. I think law firms, for example, in Washington, D.C., which we're all familiar with, law firms downsized a, a quite a while ago, which is to say law firms used to uh, have a, a, an assistant or secretary for every, every uh, lawyer practically. Uh, now they're not doing that. They don't have law libraries so much anymore. So they've been downsizing. A new phenomenon, I'm, I'm told, that law firms are saying all people have the same size office. 
partners, associates, everybody. You have an office, same size. So that's another downsize. So I do think that people will like to go back to work in an office, but I suspect that office um, use will go down a bit. On the other hand, our population is growing. And as the population grows, we'll probably you know, eventually have more space being used in commercial office buildings in five or 10 years than today, but it'd probably be with, um, you know, in a different way, different setting, different configuration. The other real estate related question is, uh, what role do you see ESG playing in the real estate industry? Well, today uh, people want to be in buildings that are seen as environmentally friendly. So if you're a developer and you say, look, I can build a building more cheaply and I can give you cheaper rents, it may not be environmentally as safe or might not be certified as environmentally uh, as good as somebody else's building, but you'll have cheaper rents. I don't think that's going to work as much as it did years ago. Uh, employees want to work in places that are seen as environmentally safe. They want to work at, the, at places that are they're, they're, they're not going to be worrying about their health. And in the end, everything is down to your health. You only have one life. And so people are not going to take risks. So I do think that the commercial real estate business is going to have to recognize that having buildings that are environmentally safe and that comply with various ESG codes is the way to go if you're going to kind of get the rents that you feel you need to get to make it a profitable business for you. There are a couple of questions here related to fintech and even uh, cryptocurrencies. Well, where, where do you come out on uh, uh, different aspects of fintech? That's a, that's a, that covers a lot of ground. There are many different uh, parts of fintech, but the, one of the questions is specifically about cryptocurrencies. Well, um, when fintech first came along, I didn't quite recognize uh, how it was going to change the world, and but it is. And now I am making investments. My firm, Carlisle, is. And personally, I'm making some investments as well uh, through a uh, family office. I, I do think that fintech is changing the world. Just think about this. When PayPal came along, I didn't really recognize right away how important it was. Uh, I sat next to it at a dinner one time, uh, the man who invented the square, who also invented uh, Twitter, Jim Dorsey. And he was showing me his little uh, device that was going to be, that's called Square. And I, I asked him about the valuation. He told me it was, I don't know, a couple hundred million dollars. I thought it was too high. Now, of course, it's worth a staggering amount of money. So I didn't recognize how fintech was going to change the world and how it's going to keep changing the world. So I was probably late to that game. Uh, they're now, Carlisle is actively invested in it. In terms of uh, Bitcoin and related uh, cryptocurrencies, I would say that, um, you know, I didn't understand Bitcoin in the beginning. I don't own any Bitcoin. I'm not sure I really understand it. But I have seen a lot of opportunities recently that have come to me in things relating to um, um, uh, cryptocurrencies and things relating to the way we're going to digitize money, money and things relating to um, uh, uh, things that use technologies that Bitcoin took advantage of. So I do think that it's, it's going to be a growth area because eventually, um, maybe not in my lifetime, but we'll probably have all money will probably be digital and it'll probably be one universal currency at some point just to make life easier. And with fintech related technologies, I think that's going to be possible. Uh, are there other areas that to where Carlisle is seeing uh, opportunities uh, from a private equity point of view, buying firms during this uh, uh, pandemic or making investments? Is there a shift in anything that Carlisle is doing? Well, I don't want to say anything other than what's been publicly announced. Um, but we have announced a number of things already in the healthcare area. We've made a lot of investments in that area. Um, and so I suspect Healthcare will continue to be an important area. Telemedicine and things like that uh, has been an area of, of some growth. Uh, we do think that um, um, you know the, that uh, the areas relating to fintech will also be attractive. But I wouldn't want to eliminate uh, manufacturing either because there's going to be a renaissance in manufacturing, made more efficient and so forth. Uh, but I do think that um, that's a good area as well. I also uh, believe that. Um, Outside the United States, China will continue to be a very attractive place to invest to a large population, very entrepreneurial society. I do think India is an extremely attractive place to invest as well. Uh, more challenges perhaps in investing and finding good deals there than maybe in China in some areas. But the other ways, we found some very good investments there. I'm very happy uh, there. So I, I do think that uh, Americans should look at uh, investing outside the United States because I think the growth opportunities are going to be pretty attractive there as well. As a general rule of thumb, I would say that COVID has 
changed the way the buyout people do deals to some extent. Uh, we are not uh, paying lower prices, uh, but we are doing things differently. It used to be the case you had to do everything in person, your due diligence. Now, while we will not invest in a company without meeting the management teams, the amount of, of, of the in-person kind of things you can do is just less. And I think that the, uh, the need to travel is less and therefore you can do your due diligence shorter periods of time. And interestingly, the private equity world has not been as adversely affected as one might expect by this because funds are getting raised at record levels. Uh, deals are getting done at, if not record levels, close to them. Exits are occurring and, and investors really still think that private equity is gonna get a good rate of return for its investors. So private equity world, world has done reasonably well. Obviously, if you invest in hotel companies, you invest in cruise ship lines, you've got some challenges. But on the whole, I think the private equity world's done pretty well. Great. Uh, so a broad question here is, uh, any thoughts on how to live a fulfilling, wholesome, and helpful life besides pursuing what one loves and working to help others? Well, my view is that uh, you're only on earth for a relatively short period of time. If you're fortunate, you probably have a life expectancy today, maybe of 80, 85, 90, something like that. And with enough medicines, maybe you can make it a little bit longer. Um, but uh, in that short period of time, you should, you should you know, do what Thomas Jefferson said, pursue happiness, though not in a way that offends other people, but find something that makes you happy. Because life is something that you know, is designed to make people happy. And happiness comes about when you help other people. So find something that you can do that is intellectually interesting that you feel you're proud to do, that your parents are proud for you to do it, you're proud of it, your children are proud of it, your partners are proud of you doing it. And it's something that you want to do because you think you're making a contribution to society. And if you make a fair amount of money out of doing that, try to give that money back to society so you can contribute to humanity. You know, we, we, that's what you know, uh, progress is all about, making the world a better place. And so I think you should experiment, find what makes you interesting, in, in, what is interesting to you and is enjoyable to you. Nobody's ever won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love it. And if it means working a little bit longer hours, do it. Make sure you have some balance in your life, but also try to give back to society. Many people who are very rich and have nothing else in their life but the amount of their uh, bank account, they're not happy people. They're tortured souls. The people that have other things in their life, they tend to be much happier. And I would like to remind people, happier people live longer than grumpy people. So find something that makes you happy and, and makes you feel that you're doing something useful and you'll probably live a longer life and a happier life and a more meaningful life. So David, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I want to invite a special guest before I ask my last set of questions. Uh, let's see if Anna can do the magic and get our special guest to be here. Here she is. Let's get Ali's uh, video up. Ali, great to see you. Uh, so Ali Rubenstein has joined us on this uh, virtual stage. And uh, folks, Ali is uh, David's daughter. She's the co-founder of uh, Manatree, a private equity firm that focuses on what we've been talking, ESG, but she's added H to it. It's, it's ESG plus H. And uh, for full disclosure, I serve as an advisor to Manatree. And many of our Georgetown students have worked with Manatree and gained just tremendous work experience working on deals with Manatree. So Ali, it's great to have you here. And uh, so my question, David, is we have many students in the audience. We have many young people in the audience. So what advice do you give Ali and your uh, other children? And what advice do you give to Georgetown students who are here today? <laughs> Well, Ellie has decided to pursue what I've called the highest calling of mankind, which is private equity. But she's done it in a certain way, which is to say she wants to do it in a way that uh, is doing ESG and H, which is health. And so she's found her passion. Now, let me explain. Um, I think that um, you can only be successful in life and enjoy life if you find something you're passionate about. Experiment. Ellie experimented with other things as well. She found something she's passionate about. So my advice to young people is, uh, don't live your parents' life. Uh, don't do only what your parents want. Uh, you have to do something that you want and that makes you happy and that makes you fulfilled. And I think it may take a while to find it, experiment, try many other things. But the advice I give to people is work hard, master a skill, focus on something, learn how to communicate with people, learn how to share the credit, learn how to um, be able to um, 
do something that is meaningful with your life and ultimately give back to society. And I and do this with integrity and also with humility. I've interviewed many great leaders. Some of them were maybe a little arrogant, but the ones I most respect have humility. And so Ellie has, um, you know, followed my, uh, you know, career a bit and uh, she's in private equity, but she's doing it much better than I am because I wasn't focused on ESG at the beginning. She is, and she's made her whole firm focus on it. And her, uh, uh, her investors are actually investing with her because of her focus on ESG. And she's coming to us today from uh, Anchorage, her home in Anchorage, Alaska. Is that right, Ellie? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dad. Um, it's funny. Everything that uh, my father just shared, I just joined on. It's ha ha happy to be here today. You know, when I when I logged in, he said the pursuit of happiness, and you know that's something I think my father has always told us. You know, when you come from a, a life of you know, means, you, know, you you always feel like you're doomed and you're never going to achieve anything. And so I think one of the things I would credit my father with is, um, you know, he's always said that. If you have unconditional love and support of your parents, you can do anything. And so I've always pursued different paths, um, not just when I was in private equity, but whether I was a young girl from D.C. and I said, I want to be a ski racer. My father about fell out of his chair. He says, you know, you're a Jewish girl from Washington, D.C. What are you going to do here? But uh, I think that, you know, what he saw was if you put your, your skill set to something and hard work, um, you don't have to be an amazing athlete or you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. But, you know, as my father's always told us, hard work has never killed anyone and obviously within balance. Um, but that's something I think that we've always tried to do. And, you know, when I think about the pursuit of happiness, um, I love food. I've always loved food. And I found a way, um, my, my father's joke was, you know, why do you always have to go hunt and fish your own food? Can't you just go buy a company where you can get it at the grocery store? And I said, no, dad, you know, I, I, I can't because there's none at scale. And I want Alaska seafood that, you know, I know is good for my food allergies. And that was actually what launched my firm was it was really a challenge from my father. Can we can we find a way to do this? Um, and so we have. And so when I think about happiness and it is long hours, you know, I got up at, I had a 4 a.m. call this morning, you know, speaking with investors in the Middle East. And, but I think the rewarding part is knowing that you're changing lives and educating a next generation of investors on what is the future of private equity look like? Also, how do you make money in this, er in this era? It's a weird thing, but our companies are doing well because we're in food. And so we like telling people how we do that. Um, but then also working with the older generation. I don't think that um, you know younger people in their 20s need to say they can go and do it better. I think it's about respecting the people that are older than you and say, okay, what do you wish you had done differently 30 years ago? And so my father has been very helpful with that because I can say, okay, you know, dad, our first fund was this size. Now what do we do? And I would remind students that, uh, you know, my career came out of my graduate degree. And so, um, you know, I had students at Rena Center that uh, were my original interns when, you know, I wrote a 563 page report uh, addressed to my father, which basically at the end of it said uh, recommendation, there were 13 recommendations. And the number one said is, dad, I'm not getting a job. And I, uh, I don't think he was happy about that. I said, but I'm going to build my own firm. But, and it's all good and fine. But I think that as long as you take the time to have a business plan, that is ultimately what matters and hold yourself accountable to it. And I opened up this capstone recently. And I kid you not, it said January 2021 launch fund two. So that's exactly kind of where we are now. But um, you know, look, I'm always happy to give people advice. I think my father as well. I have a younger brother. He's in, in a startup mode. He just got his JD MBA from Stanford. And he, you know, graduated and said the same thing. I want to do a startup. So I think, Dad, you know, maybe some advice on how to do a good startup would be helpful because, you know, you've had me do it now. You have, you know, my brother doing it now. And it is a different career path than just saying I'm going to graduate and go to Goldman Sachs. People tend to want to do things with values and meaning. And, and Dad, that's a little bit different. So maybe talk about that. Yes, the, the startup culture is an interesting one. I would say when I graduated from college in 1970, uh, which is the students do you know, hundreds of years ago, um, people didn't look at startups. They looked at trying to get a job in an established company. Today, people recognize that there's a lot of pleasure in building something yourself and being your own boss to some extent, and also in creating something that didn't exist before. So being the 10,000 person at Goldman Sachs might be rewarding in some ways. Your parents will be proud of you, I suspect, but it's not the same as building something on your own. So the people that we idolize a bit today in the business world are not the people that were the 10,000th person at Goldman Sachs. 
or even the CEO of Goldman Sachs, as good as he is, it's the people who started their own companies, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs of the world, people like that, uh, Elon Musk. These are people that took a risk, started something. And while everybody can't be an entrepreneur and start something, it's not a bad way to kind of do something before you have too many pressures to do other things. So both uh, David and Ali, the students are students who are uh, still in school, who are at uh, Georgetown at the McDonough School of Business. What should they be doing while they're in school? What kind of skill set should they be developing? And how do they, how should they be thinking about the future in terms of their skill set? Well, my own view for what it's worth, uh, and I'd be curious to hear what Ellie has to say, because uh, a different generation, is that what you study is not as relevant as the skills that you actually get. So the skill of managing time, learn how to manage your time the skill of being able to get along with people with different backgrounds, different egos, the skill of learning how to read and read and, and understand what reading is all about and how you can keep learning. Remember, when we go to a commencement, we call it a commencement because it's really the beginning of something, not the ending, but that 30% of the people who graduate from college never read another book in their life in this country. So you've got to keep learning, exercise your brain, reading and reading, practicing reading, but also practice how to talk. Practice, get, take, speak, speaking opportunities and learn how to speak orally, learn how to write in a very influential way that can influence people and recognize that people are watching you all the time. So you're a role model. When you're a role model, people will follow you if you do good things. That's how you can really influence people. But also, find something that you're interested in, experiment. You don't have to go out of college and be Mark Zuckerberg. You start a company, and that's the only thing you ever do. Try many different things. I tried many different things. Ellie tried many different things. Try different things, experiment, but have some self-confidence and go, find something you really enjoy. If you enjoy it, you can probably de develop all the skills you need, but you have to find something that you really want to do and you think you're making a difference in the world for the better. You know, Dad, I don't think I could say it better myself. I would say, you know, when I was in grad school, I did a double master's and it was online. And what I really learned from it, while it was specific to food, was time management. Because um, when you're working full time and then you have to do night hours, I would say in the investment industry, that is pretty much what our hours are. They're, the weekends and weekdays blend together just because of cultures and the way weekends work around the world. Um, and so I think time management and virtual, uh, being virtual is, you know, arguably you guys are getting what the, what the business industry is right now. And so, so much of what I learned on time management, I actually learned when I was an online grad student uh, doing virtual learning just like this. But the second thing that I would say is build your network because um, there's never been a better time to use platforms like LinkedIn and reach out to people. When I look at, we're getting ready to launch our second fund. And uh, you know, I will tell you in full disclosure, our first fund, we did not use a placement agent. Um, instead, I traveled around the world for 323 days and met people. And then we've invested in 18 countries and 19 states. And it's an incredible phenomenon right now. I can sit in my desk, you know, I'm in my, my little log cabin in Anchorage, Alaska, and I can go around the world on Zoom, never get on an airplane. It costs our firm nothing other than time and we can meet people. And so people are reaching in now from LinkedIn, from your website, and you can build your own network. So I, I think that the fundraising world has been forever shaped in that, you know, think about it, introductions are arguably free right now. Um, so it's a really great time to meet people and you never know, you know, where your next job is gonna come from. I'm gonna reference my brother again. I mean, he's building a startup from, from the ground up. And, um, you know, I think, I think that there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Uh, that, that really excites me. And I, whether you're, you know, in my situation, raising a $500 million fund or your startup and you're raising, you know, $500,000, um, there's capital out there for good ideas. And I think there's a really great um, time where people want to support young entrepreneurs that are doing uh, mission online thing. Uh, that, that's just one of the better things that's come out of this is that there's anything that can, you know, help and promote uh, people get jobs people are very supportive great ali it's uh, it's wonderful for uh, our students and the young people in the audience uh, to hear for not only from david but also from you uh, you know they can really uh, connect and associate with you so the, that is terrific uh, david any last thoughts about uh, anything my the main thing i would say to students is that Finance is an interesting way to make a living. It has intellectual um, creativity to it. It is a, it's, it's an area where, obviously, if you're good at it, you can make a fair amount of money. 
but your obsession with making money should not be uh, what you're focused on. Money comes to people who learn a skill and provide a service or a product that's good. When you provide a good skill or service and you master the arts of talking and reading and writing, and, and getting along with people, the money will flow. So don't try to just go into business because you want to make money. That should be a byproduct. You should go into business because you want to do something useful by having a good product or service, and ultimately, um, money will come if, if, if that's the business you're in. But again, um, I, I think everybody uh, should try to find something that they're passionate about. It may take a while, but you find it. My daughter's found something that she's passionate about, which is healthy related food, and she's obviously very successful in it right now. I found a passion when I built Carlisle in something I was doing, and that's what you all should do. So I congratulate you all on going to school at Georgetown. Uh, it's a great school, a great president, great uh, business school. And I want to thank uh, you, Rena, for everything you've done, to Ellie and for me and helping us uh, in various projects. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to uh, doing this again sometimes. Reed, I'd love to add to that really fast. Um, you know, I think one thing that my father mentioned, I think it's overlooked. And if you look at my dad's, even his correct career trajectory, he's CEO. But I think, you know, what gets missed on this is that my dad's skill sets are not, you know, finance. And honestly, nor are mine. And I think that what people should be looking at is how do you build partnerships? Because, you know, when you look at the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, nobody gets to be multi-billion dollar enterprises by themselves. Um, they really work well with others. And so think about what you can do and how you make yourself indefensible in an organization. Oddly, in, in our team of 10, I'm really the only one who studied food. Um, and I'm not really the one that actually day to day grows the companies, goes on the boards, or does the finance or modeling for the investments. I am in charge of fundraising and investors and vision and strategy. And that's a similar role that my father played at Carlisle. He really, um, you know, built the global strategy of how do you reinvent buyout and leverage buyouts and having multiple funds at once and doing the fundraising. And so just don't be hard on yourself if there's an industry you want to be in. Um, you know, make it worthwhile. I wanted to invest in companies, but I found great partners that helped me to do it. And then the lastly, I want to reiterate on the point my father said, um, you know, I spent 10 years, I would say getting to this point, but most of it where I found my passion was really by volunteering or being in the outdoors. And I'm an avid hunter and fisherman and I do source all my own food. I, you know, pack 18 cooler bags to mail out to friends and family and investors last night of food I've sourced, whether that was, you know, my moose or my bison, I went and got, um, you know, salmon, halibut, shrimp. And that's what keeps my love of food is doing that. Nor, nor, no different than also volunteering. And in many ways, I think I've done probably more on the philanthropy side than the investing side. But philanthropy, whether you're giving back to an education, a university, doing things like this, all you really have in life is your time. And so think about it. If there's a void in your life, where can you go volunteer in something that, that you like? Because it's more likely that if you enjoy it, you're going to steer towards that in a career path. And so now there are ways to make money in areas, you know, that are more maybe on the, the nonprofit side, but don't rule it out. And, you know, this is a great time the next year you have to do anything, absolutely anything. And um, my closing advice to you all is really don't listen to what your parents' advice are. I love my father and I love my father dearly, but I think he would tell you that I have always done things when I find my own path. Um, and that's, you know, why I'm sitting in Alaska today. And I think what matters more is spend time with your family so they understand your um, decision-making for what makes you happy. And then they will support you 150%. So, you know, don't forget about your family during this time. We're all separated. You know, I'm 3,000 miles away from my dad, but, you know, we still talk daily and, you know, he's still my biggest fan. So that's what I would encourage you guys to do right now is, um, you know, come up with a creative idea, do something different. You won't regret it. You're going to regret it more if you don't take the risk because then you're not going to be living a life of happiness. So that's what I would say to you all. Great, great. Uh, David, thank you so thank you. much. Really appreciate uh, having you here today. And uh, Ali, it's uh, terrific to see you and uh, really appreciate all the support all right. that uh, the center and the business school uh, get from, uh, from all of you. Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Bye. We'll uh, see you tomorrow. We have a great program for tomorrow. So uh, please sign in uh, tomorrow. Take care.